I'm super glad to have you join me today for my talk with my longtime friend and respected colleague, Jason Cohen. I wanted to have Jason on here to share his knowledge and what he has found that works to create a calm and happy dog that can walk by lots of distractions and behave well in a very busy city. He has a dog training business in Brooklyn called Canine Cohen, and that's canine spelt out C-O-H-E-N. I've worked with Jason on lots of little projects, and we bounce things off each other. I greatly respect how he trains dogs in a very difficult situation of Brooklyn. Jason and I do train dogs differently because he uses a lot of food to help train dogs, and I usually don't do that so much. But that doesn't mean we aren't friends and we don't get along, and we actually can grow by talking to each other about these differences in our training. Thanks for being here with me today. First, a word from our sponsor, which is my business, Heart to Heart Canine Training. This podcast isn't free to host, so I wanted to just tell everyone about some opportunities that I have. I have an online subscription starting this month, focusing on fearful and feral dogs. This month, we're focusing on building trust but I guarantee the things that you will learn in this online subscription will carry over to all your dog training. I also am having a workshop in Idaho in June in person about fearful and feral dogs. And of course, the original fearful feral dog workshop happening in May in Las Vegas, New Mexico. Please check out my website, hearttoheartcanine.com, H A R T. Number two, H-E-A-R-T-C-A-N-I-N-E. Thank you. I think we met yeah. at the RBBM workshop in Philadelphia. Was it there or did I think I met you at a conference before that? I wasn't sure. I thought I, I met you after you presented a conference. I think it was oh, a white maybe. paper. Your first yeah, white maybe. paper. And then I, 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 I was like, wow, I need to meet this person. And we started chatting and then, yeah, then I, yeah, the RBBM was in Philly. With, I, and that was eight years ago. And I don't know, we've always just gotten along. You're funny. I always laugh really hard when I'm with you. And I think because we're both kind of artists, right? Yeah. We, we kind of get each other and and how we're creative and and yet how sensitive we can be at the same time, right? Yeah, and I think we're also very process motivated um, as we served on the board together um, of the IACP, um, International Association of Canine Professionals. I think that also helps. Yeah. I think it's also how we look at helping dogs as well. I don't think either one of us uh, starts a project without the intention to do it to our best ability, which yeah, yeah, can be a blessing and a curse, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> For people listening, the art background for me, I was an art director in advertising for 20 years before I was a trainer. So that's where that comes from. So the thing I like about Jason, and one of the reasons why he's doing this podcast with me, is that he is a good sounding board for my thoughts and my little projects. And he'll always be honest with me. <laughs> yeah. I think sometimes too honest. <laughs> well, you know, but it's it's from a good place, right? It's it's yeah. from a mutual like we both want to help each other sort of thing. He had some feedback about the podcast I did about the fearful and feral dogs. I wanted to set a few things straight and I wanted to have him on because I do say that I don't use food in that podcast. However, then I'm, I'd have to listen back to it to figure out how exactly I said it. But I didn't mean to have the attitude of like, I'm better than people because I don't or that I don't ever, which isn't true. I use quite a lot of food rewards for the dogs. Jason works in a much different environment than me. He lives in Brooklyn. He has to make adjustments to how he trains dogs based on the environment he's in. There's never one, only one path to achieve something. Since the name of my podcast is what dogs have taught me, they've taught me that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. like, if we try to use one process on every dog, it's usually not going to have the best success. So we need to be able to change. And Jason has really good training methods. I did admin work for Jason for a couple years, maybe. 
So I got to read uh, the applications of his clients and kind of be involved in how he trains dogs. And uh, honestly, I couldn't do that for people that I don't believe in their training methods. I got to read about some of the difficult cases he has <laughs> and, and how effective he is. He has a lot of insight about training and using different methods and how he uses food, I think, is really good because he gets positive results, yet the dogs remain calm. Go ahead into that a little bit. Okay. I've always liked using food when I got into dog training. Heather Beck, who we both have learned from, actually told me that I was too reliant on food. And she was right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that Back to the name of the podcast, which I do love, what dogs have taught taught us, or what has it taught me? Taught me. Um, but. but yeah, taught me too. Is I started working with a lot of dogs that were fearful, and you can't rely on food in a lot of the situations, especially when they're past their threshold. I actually went to learn from people that didn't use food. So Heather Beck, somebody that, again, doesn't really use food for the most part. Nelson Hodges, again, someone we both learned from, doesn't really use food. Even Phyllis, Phyllis Smooland, who I learned from as well, obviously one of your mentors. Mm -hmm. In general, how she trains doesn't use food. Okay, but because, again, like you said, I'm in the city and compared to some of the people I, I just mentioned, Heather takes dogs into a socialization environment in her boarding and her socialization really helps. Nelson takes dogs for three months. Okay. So (laughs) he could take a lot more time. And Phyllis also is more, she's taken the dog for a longer period. I have for the average student, four lessons is what I work with. The other part is I live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, One of the (laughs) hardest places to train a dog. People that don't think so come visit and hang out we, when you were hanging out one time you're like oh it's pretty loud i'm like this isn't loud <laughs> i talk to other people on the phone as i'm walking my dog they go it sounds really loud i go this isn't loud and there's a lot of distractions dogs other dogs everywhere um, depending where you are squirrels rats scooters e-bikes kids loud trucks the compressed air from the buses everywhere you go As soon as you walk outside, most of the dogs I'm working with are over threshold, overstimulated. You can't always use food. It can't always be the number one thing. So something you mentioned in your recent podcast about renaming it when you were at, where were you again? The Grand Canyon? Yeah. 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 And how people use food. I see people do the same thing. They do touch, 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 and want the dog to touch their hand, or they're trying to distract the dog with food and lure them away. They're too late. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't use food in that manner. And I'll I'll go into detail more on how I do, but I don't use it in that manner because it's too late. Once they're past that threshold, food doesn't really matter. Okay. That's where I go back to my education with Heather and Nelson and Phyllis and you. Okay. Of more use of the leash and use of pressure, or as Nelson says, tension on the leash, and release to communicate. More negative reinforcement to communicate that way because they don't care about the food. And not just fear, overstimulated, overexcited dogs that want to say hi to the other dogs. You got a treat, yeah, but the idea of saying hi to the dog is more rewarding than your treat in your hand, or that prey, that cat, or things like that. Again, a lot of people sometimes think I'm positive only trainer because I use clickers and food. I am more on the positive side, I guess. Um, the, the word in the training world is balanced trainers, and I don't consider myself one. I consider myself open-minded. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm more of an open-minded trainer. And you know, something me and Julie came up with is the acronym for MUT trainer. Many unique training techniques. Oh okay? yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. So <laughs> we're mutts just like our dogs, most of our dogs, okay? (laughs) Another thing that I'll bring into it, which was eye-opening for me and really nice for me is when um, you were showing Phyllis one of the videos. I was working with a fearful dog um, that has a bite history. And one of the techniques I I do is I do use food with fearful dogs when first meeting them, but I do it more as a diagnostic rep than, hey, 
peers take a piece of food from me, we're buddies now. So it's more diagnostic rep in some ways. That's how I use it. So I, sh- back in the day, would share videos with you and you would share with Phyllis. Now I go directly. Okay. And Phyllis said to you, but you don't use stretch. food with that dog. <laughs> yeah. Right? Don't <laughs> use food with that money. dog. It was a Jindu full bite issue. Don't use food with that dog. So then Julie tells me, then she showed her the video of me using food with that dog. And Phyllis goes, eh, not a bad way to use food. Right. And that's one of the great things about someone like Phyllis and you and the people I learned from, even though it's not what she would do. And she has, you know, 20 or 30 more years experience than me. She goes, oh, it's not a bad way to use it. And that's where I wanted to talk about it because in the training world, from the quote unquote balance side, we get very upset with positive only trainers when we say, don't use a prong collar, don't use a shock collar, don't do this, don't do that. But I keep hearing the same thing is, why are you using food? It makes them excited, makes this thing, makes that, you know, don't use medication, don't use this. They're all tools. And just like anything else, you can use a hammer to build a house. You can use a hammer to kill somebody. Okay. (laughs) How do you use the tool? So it's not the tool, it's the fool. Food is a tool. Medication is a tool. Let's not overly rely on one, but how can it help? The one podcast with you and Becky, it just, and I know it just, you didn't mean it that way because I know both of you, (laughs) but it comes across sometimes like, I didn't use food. You didn't use food. Didn't give cookies. And, And I'm like, just because you don't use it doesn't mean it's wrong. But I know why you're saying that because I see it in the city all the time too. People are expecting the food to be magic right? and the yeah. food to solve the problem instead of just being part of the equation. For instance, with fearful dogs, so that, that's the topic you, you got, uh, was talking about, then I can talk about reactive dogs. What I do in a few situations where if the dog has a bite history and I'm not sure about it, I meet it at the crate. So I take away the owner on leash, adding tension, adding conflict. Yes, there can be barrier frustration, but the dog can step away. So again, something with your... We should also mention the apartments and things that you go in are much smaller than like a suburban home. Yes. General, and I'll I'll tackle this more again, we talk about the outside stuff. Yes, when working in Brooklyn, New York, and in city environments, apartments are smaller. So one, you know, it's harder because there's less space. And even if you have a high rise building with an elevator, that's other complications. So when I go into people's homes, start dogs usually in a crate. So I could do an evaluation where I take the owners out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Again, it's just something I do. And I understand the problem that can be barrier frustration, but I take away the aspect of the leash where the owners, and I've had it happen where they tighten the leash, then the dog comes after them. Yeah. Or they don't meet them it. Or, well, yeah, I give them, this is what I say to my students when I do let them bring the dog on leash after. I say, I tell them how to hold the leash. I go over being a supportive shadow that Heather taught me. But I say, if you drop the leash and the dog comes after me, I do know how to defend myself. I don't want to do it. Your dog's not going to like it. Let's take things slow so the dog doesn't feel the need to come after me. And most of the time, I'm telling them to drop the leash and we work through things, uh, which I'll go over. When I go meet them at the crate, it's back to things you talk about. Nelson taught me, which how I approach with my body language, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I do use food. But it's not, hey, I'm, a good, I'm, I'm your buddy now. Take food from me. So I will drop a piece of food when they're barking sometimes. If the dog eats it, I'm like, oh, the dog's comfortable enough to eat it. If the dog is ignoring it, they're not. Yeah. Okay. And that's all I'm using it for. And I'll go from a dog barking at me to me handing it a treat through the crate, usually within a few minutes. I will sometimes use a marker and we can deeper into when you were talking about using food and, and letting them understand why they're getting it. But I will, if they stop barking, mark and then drop food, or if they look at me eventually or make eye contact, I'll start marking and rewarding that. But then outside the crate, from the dog, more of a submissive posture. I'm not creating that I'm a bad person or creating um, stranger danger because I'm making myself small and I don't want them to think I'm a threat. 
And I let the person bring the dog out on leash and I let them pull. It's okay. And based on the body language, I usually met them just drop the leash if I don't think the dog's going to come and try to maul me, which usually it's just fear and oh. it's just nonsense barking. And I have a video which I might post later. And I do a thing that other people call basically treat retreat. Is it exactly that? I don't know. It's just something that's out there. But what I'll do is if the dog's not comfortable coming near me, I'll toss a piece of food towards them. Actually, we did this with Hawkeye, right? Yes. Yeah. I think we had a video of that that I never finished editing. Okay. <laughs> but I toss a piece of food towards them. If they eat it, they're comfortable enough to eat it, which is, again, diagnostic rep. Let's explain the diagnostic because I know what you mean. Okay. And I think what you mean is that when you say when I'm working with dogs and using food for something, let's say I just had a dog that didn't like a leash put on, right? Mm -hmm. If that dog is taking food and then they won't, it's kind of a signal that something's happened to make the dog uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. If a dog that is and step back a little yeah. bit. So right. when I use I use food and I use treats or and also the value of the food matters. A lot of people are like my dog won't take their kibble. That's pretty low value. Right. So you could use treats or something I like to use that's higher value is freeze dried raw. Instead of just treats, I'll do freeze-dried raw, like Stella and Chewy's. Over here, we have Raw Dynamic, other places, Primal. But a freeze-dried raw meal, so we're actually using their meal, they're eating their meal, and making a positive association. If I can use something of a higher value, there you go. Yeah. Some of the lessons that I always found humorous, I'll be with um, people with fearful dogs. They go, oh, they'll never eat a treat. And I toss one, and this is always funny for me. Dogs will take it, eat it, and spit it out. And then you see them go, huh, that's not so bad. Then they go and eat it. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's something new. And I'm always like, and I always find that interesting. And then they're like, can I have another? <laughs> okay. And again, it's using the value of the food matters too. Sometimes just cook up some chicken, mozzarella cheese or manchego cheese, a friend of mine uses, are great too. But if you give them a lot of cheese, we know what that can lead to. So I'd rather use, if I can, a form of their meal at a higher value. If the dog takes the food and eats it, they're comfortable enough to do it. If the dog is not, it tells me they're not comfortable enough to eat it. Also, when I meet my students, I say, don't feed them. So I know at least they're a little more hungry. Same thing outside. I have dogs that will take food inside. Outside, they're like, nope. Okay, they're not comfortable. Mm. And something I'll talk about later is I will use food to change associations. But right now, I just use it as a diagnostic rep to start. If they're eating, okay, that's good. Yeah. And then I start using it to say, okay, well, I'm not a bad person. I'm giving you food. I'm not trying to pet you. I'm not reaching towards you. That's the other thing. I'm not reaching to give them the treat. Right. So what I'll do is I'm tossing food towards them and then slowly tossing the food closer to me. And then the dog gets closer to me. I might hold the food out in my hand, not reaching, just out. If the dog takes it out of my hand, great. If not, I just drop it. What I point out to my students a lot, the dog will have their legs sort of reaching where right. they're just getting near me. But that's also, dog's telling me I'm not comfortable, but the treat's mm, worth it a bit. But part of it is not just the food, but how I'm interacting with the dog. The yeah. big mistake a lot of people do is they give the dog a treat, they take the treat. Now we're buddies. And then they go to pet the dog. They're like, mm, we're not buddies, but thanks for the food. Yeah. Where's your mindset at that point? Is it, I mean, I, I would assume you're fairly calm internally. Yeah, right? I'm calm. Excitement at all. I'm not playing the go run for the food. Other dogs. Yeah. Other dogs that I'm using their drive as many trainers do. And try to and, and play or drive. Yeah, I'm, I'm chasing food. I'm not doing that. I'm using the food as motivation to come closer to me. Okay. And then once, back to the treat and retreat. Once they're comfortable closer to me, then I'll toss the food away. Then when I don't need the sort of Hansel and Gretel trail, they come to me, I toss the food away. They come to me, I toss the food away. What gets them the food? Coming towards me. I'm still not petting them. I'm still not reaching towards them. If they hang by me, I'll hold out the food. They take it. If they stay there, I might give them a little scruff under their chin. The big mistake, again, what people do is we're buddies. You gave me food. Yeah. The example I tell my students that is from my childhood. 
is when I was a kid, and I'm in my 50s, so this is a long time ago, my great grandma would give me a dollar every time she saw me. Okay, pretty cool. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a good association. My grandmother's brother, so what is that, great uncle? Okay. Yeah. He would give me a hundred dollar bill every time he saw me. And remember, what? this is a long time ago. A hundred dollars was a hundred dollars then. Ah. Okay. So he would he would give each of us, the kids, a hundred dollars every time. I knew nothing about him, but I liked him. Cool dude. I was excited when he showed up. We found out later there was a, a little mafia connection, but no. <laughs> back in the day. Okay. But Again, I don't. I can't say I knew my uncle. I can't say anything, but I just remember when he showed up, I got that. A lot of people take the mistake of taking food as what you were saying. We have a relationship now. No, we don't. No, we don't. My uncle gave me a hundred dollar bill. I don't have a relationship with him, but thanks. Okay. So again, over time, this guy comes. I get food. Not a, not okay. I remember that, and then we can slowly build. The part that builds a relationship is the other stuff you talk about, how I interact with the dog, how I use my body language, how I approach the dog, and how I have patience and let them tell me I'm comfortable with you petting the top of my head. I'm comfortable with you petting here based on what they do. Yeah. But because I don't have a month to get used to the dog living with me, I don't have other dogs to use as for socialization i'm going to a strange dog i don't know in their home and we only have so much time yeah so okay so that's basically with fearful dogs with that but then i also use food to change associations i'll use it to change associations of a leash change associations of a trigger change associations of an environment so if we stay on the topic of fearful dogs what I have my students do, if they're too uncomfortable in the crate or dogs that don't like being in the crate, we feed them in the crate. We give them all chews and cons and stuff in the crate. Okay, all good things in the crate. For fearful dogs that don't want to come out of the crate, we focus on rewarding them out of the crate. For dogs that are uncomfortable outside, some of the things we'll do is just sit on your porch and just feed them their meal. Again, if we can get something higher value. In the city, if they, if you people have a rooftop for higher buildings, go up there. Or if they have a terrace, sit out there, have your coffee, and just feed your dog their meal. I had a student where the dog wouldn't go near a certain corner. It was too scary. I go, okay, feed your dog at that corner. Corner's not so scary anymore. Now, yes, I will use clickers and food and stuff like that in, in that way. But a lot of times, I'm just like, you get the food in this environment. Other ways with a tool. So dogs that don't like a slip leash going over their head or something going over their head. I have a piece of food in my hand. As they're eating the food, leash goes off and change that there. Heather's hero sidekick or transitional leash, a head halter. I have a technique I call kitchen open, kitchen close. At a recent workshop, had a, they had a dog that was like, nope, you're not putting this on my head. Not happening. Mm -mm, not dealing with it. She goes, let me try Jason's. <laughs> this is, um, kitchen open, kitchen closed technique. All of a sudden, this dog's comfortable with it going on the nose, over the snout. So what do I do there? I basically put the food over the snout, apply some pressure, and food, 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 food. Take it off, no food. Put it on, food, food, food. Over time, they're like, okay, when that comes on, I get food. I like food. I need to eat. Good deal. I don't do it forever. It doesn't create excitement. Yeah. Okay get why i don't want excitement in those things and i have videos for these things and you can see them on my youtube channel and other places my social medias i'm not creating excitement in this situation i'm changing association other things i do is food trails so again fearful dogs that won't walk one of the things i do in the home is take the owners out of the equation they're afraid to move around the house so i'll have them take a food trail and again using their meal so again if we can use a high value version of their food like yeah. a freeze-dried raw which is great and healthy we do a food trail right in front of you know where they're comfortable usually around the living room then they have the owner sit back down and just wait ignore the dog take themselves out of the equation and they just eat the food trail okay a line of food easy then we make a more difficult pattern or a longer pattern 
going further in the house. In New York, a lot of apartments are railroad style, so they're very long. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then maybe we have them go up and over some laundry, or up and over some different things, or yeah. under a chair, depending the size of the dog, and make sort of obstacles. Right. And this I got from Nelson. A happy dog is a dog using their nose yeah. and in movement. So what are we doing? Using their nose, movement. One thing also crosses my mind too is, so I know like we've talked about the differences in in clients versus Wild West versus East Coast, right? Part of dog training, maybe the most difficult part is finding things that the clients can and will do with the dog. 100%. So if, if I had a client that felt more comfortable using food in the way you're describing I would totally be like, great, let's do that. Because you have to find what the client feels good about doing too. It's not just mm-hmm. what you can do with the dog by yourself. And, and again, I like using the leash. And a lot of times students I find like using food or aren't uncomfortable with using the leash correctly. Or a lot of times use too much force. Right. So things I'll do if we want to keep on the food trail thing. But there is a fun video. It's long. And this is something the dog taught me. So I think it's a, I think you've seen it. I actually want to add a voiceover. This dog, again, from Korean Canine Rescue, just to bring that up, a lot of dogs I've worked with came from them and they really helped me learn more about fearful dogs. So they came from the meat trade, obviously not good socialization, a lot more Jindo and Shiva mixes. So different type of dog. Okay. So this one dog, what the dog would do is when she did the food trail, come out of the crate, take the food, and then go back into the crate and eat it. She's like, well, I don't know what to do. I'm like, people sometimes don't see what's right in front of them. I'm like, well, close the door of the crate. (laughs) And the video, it's on YouTube. And if you want, I can give you the link if you want to attach it to you. It's pretty fun. It's longer, but if you like watching dog behavior, it's I find interesting. She did a long food trail from the crate throughout her apartment past her kitchen a lot of scary stuff the dog comes out eats the food looks back at the crate door and goes huh can't do that looks at the whole line of all the good food goes eh, it's worth it and then walks a bit eats some food guess i'll Not keep fast, going but does it and i'll keep going <laughs> then he gets to a certain point and there's a scary refrigerator making the scary noises oh, that they yeah. make right Cross oh, noise scary thing. yeah and you see again, he looks at the noise, backs up a bit, crate doors close. I, huh, I am hungry. I do like this food. This is the voiceover I think I want to do on this. And then walks past that, you know, and then moves forward. Okay. Now this dog, you know, just doesn't need all that, but it helped him going. I walked past that trigger. Nothing scary happened. I'm not being forced to do it. I'm using my nose and good things are happening. Yeah. Food, not excitement. Dogs need to eat. So again, I, I'd rather not use the word treat. Sometimes if you need to, you have a treat, a food, a cheese, you can also mix it up. But that's why I like using a form of their meal that's high value that you can use for training you don't mind putting on your floor. Right. Okay. And that's the problem. That's the good thing about the freeze-dried raw is because I don't want like raw food all over. 100%. House, yeah. right so and it's not just a freeze-dried treat it's a complete meal and that's why yeah. they they ate and especially with small dogs done so that was again i use food trails for that and then some things i do like i had a dog that when you know walking them on leash around the house w- would it work and there's a video of this with a dog named nori and again then going it's funny like you'll walk the dog on leash fine and they'll go on their dog bed fine but when you're holding the leash they're like i'm not walking on that bed and they'll try to walk around it it's like yeah. what uh, why you, you you sleep on the bed or oh, you holding the leash like mm, i don't know about that <laughs> what is that trust right yeah. so what do i do food trail and then food trail while you're holding the leash and eventually less and less food and maybe then adding some leash leash pressure and again you can see a video of the dog again gaining comfort and stuff i've also done it outside dog that's comfortable outside will add a food trail on an elevated surface, a little urban parkour, building right. confidence, going up and over things. I have dogs like walk a wall or elevated surfaces, building that confidence. And sometimes just a food trail to help while you hold a leash. And then the big problem I find is people don't fade the food away. 
Mm. Okay. Yeah. I'm working with a student right now that has trick training titles on her dog. But now when she walks her dog, she's feeding a whole meal throughout the walk. I'm like, that's great if you're doing the obedience, but you've got to fade the food. And then you make it training, learning theory. It's intermittent. Then it's not there. So, so explain that a little. How do I want to phrase this? With my dogs, I mean, again, I live in the country, so much different environment. But even like their entire lives, I'll practice recall. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they get a, a reward, sometimes not, right? But that's a little different. That's more like maintenance training, I think. Well, if you... Again, this is all, if anybody wants to read about it, it's from when I learned, I went to Starmark Academy and our main book that we learned from is How Dogs Learn. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's a great book. I've that book somewhere around here. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, they talk about the four A's and, you know, it's how dogs learn, right? So I'm not going to go all into all of it unless you want me to, but the last phase is always in maintenance, mm. right? Yeah. I don't know if you want me to go through all, do you want me to do all phases? No, but maybe go into like how you fade the food when you know okay, yeah. fading. Well, what I what I'll go into basically when I teach them and I've gone through the, the learning steps and all that, and now the dog basically knows it. And the, the main theory, not on behavior, is dogs take two to four weeks to learn, three to six months to transfer to long-term memory based on the book and what I've read. Obviously, people might disagree and say, no, it's this way. Well, welcome to talking to dog trainers. But that's what the book says. That's what I learned go through the learning stages, right? But the last stage, always in maintenance, is the three to six month period, the intermittent period, okay? Mm. Where I'm not rewarding every time, third time, 15 millionth time. What I, though, tell my students and what I consider, it's the rest of their lives. I want to keep the hope alive. I want to keep that hope alive that they will get a reward for the rest of their lives. So I call it a slot machine mentality. Right. Okay. When my dogs poop and in the city, yes, we have to pick up the poop and it's outside and we do that. Should. You know, they have to go. Well, we should. <laughs> yeah. Some people don't. My dog, Whiskey, a lot of times he'll look up at me like, I pooped, dad, I pooped. And does he still get a reward? Sometimes. Yeah. Is it why he pooped? No, we had a poop. Right. <laughs> okay. But he went, he held it till he's supposed to and gave it to him and he's so happy. And so do I still reward him? Sure. Every time? No. He'll give me the attention heel for the next block of the walk, hoping for it. Right. Do I sometimes give more than I need to? Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. I give dogs treats for just being cute. Okay? No. But but in general terms, back to what you're saying, once they understand the behavior and we've built the reward and reinforcement history of what we're trying to do, they don't get a reward every single time for the rest of their lives. And uh, the food, for the most part, that I'm using for training, which relates more back to what you were saying happened with the people that are just like, food, 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 treat, treat, treat. People do the recall, they yell treat, okay? For the most part, I'm rewarding for a behavior that's done, okay, in obedience-wise, right? Or motivating to do the behavior. But the dog that I mentioned coming out of the crate, it walks over the apartment now. For the dog that we use the food outside on the walk, they just walk. So so another way I use food. Yes, go on. This is something interesting that I've noticed with fearful dogs is, you know, because I'll use food to, I don't know if you want to call it desensitization or counter condition, whatever you want to call Mm -hmm. it, especially like certain objects or movements or my floor, things like that. I have no problem using food for that stuff. And I find when I stop using the food, they don't get afraid of the thing again. Nope. It's, okay, so I'll give you an example of that. Um, we're working with a greyhound. I think it was a greyhound. And it was fine, except for the one part of the floor that was near the door. I don't know if it's the fridge, whatever. Just we're scared of it. Yeah. So, yep, food trails is one of the things we do. The other thing I do is something I got from Chad Mackin, leaky toddler, which is I just dropping food. Like, That's you know, kids do for dogs. <laughs> Leaky toddler, just dropping the food. But basically, after we did the food trail and the dog on its own would went, we hung out in the area and just dropped food. And the dog ate it. I got a video, but no one will understand the context because I'm very bad at getting before videos. Yeah. I came to that person's home later in training, and I opened the door, and the dog ran to me. I cried. <laughs> Seeing a dog that was scared to go on the floor run to say hi to me yeah. 
Yeah, the dog should have run and jumped on you. I didn't care. Right. The dog was so comfortable, didn't care about it. There's no food anymore. But we changed the association. I'm the treat guy. So there you go. That's what they call me. Well, but okay. I'll give you an example. But, yeah. Yeah. But that's downplaying what you do. Yeah. Because, you know, one thing that we talk about a lot is that you also encourage a lot of the structure in the home and the people become mm-hmm. structure more protectors and leaders of their dogs and things like that. So you represent all of that, right? You represent safety, yeah. fun, because you have a lot of fun with your dogs when, you, when you're training them. I try. I say advocacy and management a lot. Yeah. And it's something I do preach, especially in a city environment, and especially with the do- type of dogs I work with that are fearful, reactive, is you have to advocate for your dog and you have to manage the situation. That's why I'm a big proponent of using the crate. Because until the training's there, if a dog's uncomfortable with someone coming in a home, take them out of the situation. Yeah. A situation that leads to a lot of bites. So yeah, I can work on teaching alternate behaviors and I can work on using spatial pressure. But until I can have the dog in the crate, have the person come in, then bring the dog out. You just took away the biggest part of conflict that's going on there. A big thing a lot of people do with fearful dogs is, well, we'll meet the dog outside. Sure. And I know it works. What happens if it's pouring rain, freezing, or I'm running late and there's no time for it? I've also had dogs that in the house want to bite me. Outside, take treats, love me. Go back in the house, want to bite me again. Yeah. Again, about changing associations, a personal thing. My dog, Karma, my smaller dog, I've learned from her over the years. She's a single event type of learner or whatever you want to call it, where something bad happens and she holds on to that. Mm. Okay. When she was a puppy, I just moved into my apartment long before I got her. And I have a little outside area. When I first turned my stove on or oven on, all the fire alarms went off. I wasn't even oh. cooking anything, but welcome to New York and oh, no. the apartments. So I took her, she's a puppy, and I put her in my uh, my deck area, my outside area, just for her ears. And then I'm sitting there with a broom, you know, trying to knock <laughs> off and turn the, you know, fire alarms off. Didn't think anything of it. And then I got her in the summer. So all summer, I have a barbecue out there. And I'm just barbecuing, cooking out there. Single guy, not doing much cooking in the house. In the city, we also order in a lot. So now it gets colder, and I'm not doing that. And I turned the stove on. Ah. She goes to the door to the outside. I told you about this, right? I don't know if you told no? me this story. Okay. This is, again, before I was a trainer. This is when it was just a hobby. Right. It was a hobby for about five years, and I had friends that were trainers. So she goes to the door and she starts showing her avoidance and appeasement signals. She starts yawning, tongue flicks, eventually drooling. And eventually she pooped herself. If I wouldn't let her go outside because of the scary stove or gas going on, she pooped herself. I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? So I talked to one of my friends who's a trainer and he talked about counter conditioning and all that. And she did have a foundation of place, something I do use to create a safe place for dogs. Yeah. So again, for as a trainer, many, many moons ago, I used a food trail to get her from the door where the outside area was to my kitchen. Not a huge space in Brooklyn, but <laughs> okay. And then I had just a, you know, a woven blanket and I got in Mexico yeah. and fold it up and I had to go to place right there. Then I slowly, what I did is I would turn the gas on and I had a leash on her and I started marking with a clicker and rewarding as the trigger. The big thing when I do things like this is control the trigger the best you can. Yeah. Okay. I did talk about this on another podcast. And what we realized wasn't even the gas going on. It was the smell of the gas that triggered her anxiety. Uh, okay. That's how early it goes on. She goes, oh, what's going to happen? And if the fan kicked in or anything like that, even worse. So I had her there and I just turned the stove top on and just started marking and reward. Great. Yeah. And I slowly, over time, built to where I would take some cold cuts and sizzle them. And, you know, because a sizzle would obviously scary, then the fan, scary. And I'm just marking and rewarding. And then guess what you would get? Some of those cold cuts. Yeah. Mm, good stuff. And she's very food motivated. But after a while, she didn't care. She, I, I call it, she went from pooping herself to what you're cooking, dad. Yeah. Okay. One day I should write this up. Okay. I didn't get videos, stupid me. <laughs> That'd be a great title. Then. Yeah. <laughs> From pooping but, yourself to what you're cooking. But, 
<laughs> here's the interesting thing. So then I took her to Starmark when I went to school, right? Yeah. Didn't care about any of the stoves there. Huh. When we got back, Starmark, you know, it's like a three month, um, 12 weeks or so program. Then I, and I drove there and drove back and took my time from Texas. When I got back, I went to turn the stove on. It came back. Oh, it's going to happen again. So I just did about one more, one or, one or two more sessions. Yeah. Never seen it again. No problem. Okay. So evil food. Okay. Yeah. Never created excitement, create association. Another thing with my dog, Karma, I'm walking her. And all of a sudden, around July 4th, a firework goes off. Uh-huh. I buy us, but this is also why I still walk around a slip leash and it's still a sidekick. But then I just put that over her nose so she's not choking herself. Got her calm yeah. with not food, with leash pressure. Got her calm, walked yeah. her home. But then every time if I walk by the same area around the same time of night, she's like, whoa, it's going to happen again. What did I do? I started marking and rewarding in that area around that moment. And now she doesn't care. Yeah. Same things when I work with reactive dogs. But does that make sense with that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I've done tons of stuff similar. And I mean, those are those are good examples, too, of that superstitious behavior, right? Or superstitious. Mm-hmm. Like something else happens and the dog thinks it's associated with this and so it's always going to happen and stuff yeah i had a dog that was like moderately afraid of thunderstorms the thing about living where i live is we don't have a lot of them yes <laughs> so it's hard to solve the issue because there's not a lot of opportunity but what i ended up doing with her she loved to do like little tricks and little obedience tricks and shake hands first sure. so as soon as i knew it was coming we'd go outside and we'd do some of that Right. And she had a mm-hmm. good time. And mm-hmm. then we'd go inside and I'd give her like a bully stick or something. Yeah. And so of course she got adopted. I don't know. I'm assuming she's still fine. But for the rest of the summer, which is only when we have the the thunderstorms, she'd start going, There's thunder. Can we go That's outside? Right. You know, yeah. and do our little thing. So it can be a very like powerful. Tool. Well, it doesn't have to be food. You're using another thing that, again, if you go into the brain, the dopamine yeah. and all the different stuff that, you yeah. know, I can't pronounce. Something but, dogs you know. like, basically. Right. Well, on that note, Karma, again, had issues with thunderstorms. She had issues with the fireworks, okay? A few years ago was basically what you did. As soon as the fireworks start, and my dog does have obedience, so I just ran through some obedience and tricks that she had. So for the five, ten minutes of the fireworks show, we just did fun obedience. She never cared about it. Yeah. So I did that a bunch. And but you know, you have to have the obedience to do that. Right. But you can also just play with your dog, you know, do tug, do chase, whatever around the environment if they can handle it. What I've done over the few last few years, don't need to, but I hang by my TV. I'm not going out on New Year's as much as I used to. I'm not (laughs) going out and those things. I'm home. No big deal. So I just have food or meal or whatever. And as soon as that, because in Brooklyn, doesn't have to be the actual fireworks display. Right. You will have random fireworks right outside your house. And yeah. it's lovely. It's lots of fun. And you know, it's not a, 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 an actual gun going off. They sound differently. You get to know that living oh, well. world. In Albuquerque, <laughs> we have both on those occasions. <laughs> yeah. So what I would do is, as soon as I heard a firework, I just said, yes, and just toss some food on the ground. Yes, yeah. and just toss some food. And what started happening is firework, oh, there's my food. And after a while, fireworks, so what? So what I tell people, and if you want, I'll talk about how I use it for, again, leash reactivity and stuff. I try to get the dog from a fearful, reactive, anxious state to a happy state to a neutral state. Yeah. A lot of people never get away from that excitable state. Okay. Yeah. One of the things in the city, you can always, and that's what I reached out to you also. I liked your reactive dog video. And again, the premise of what you want to do, I, I agree with. Again, other people in the city do do more long line work. But for me, I'm a little more control freak, I guess. <laughs> I want the students to have better control of the dog. And I, don't like giving them too much leash in a city environment because things come out of nowhere. Yes. People will have their dogs in a long retractable and the dog will turn the corner before the owner's even there. I've, yeah. I actually seen a person do that and the dog's a little 
little Frenchies going up to a husky I worked with that previously took an eye out of, of, a, of a pit bull. Oh. So I don't think that's a good idea. And dog's doing great now, but I'm across the street yelling, like, don't let that happen. And yeah. the owner thanked me, but people are like, well, nothing bad happened. Should we wait until the husky picks up your dog and does yeah. something? That's not. <laughs> so have control of the leash. Okay. A short, but not tight leash. The key is not tight leash, not adding tension in situations. And listen, if you could cross the street when there's a trigger, great. If you could add space, great. I tell my students, one, and I need to write this out more, but first create space when you can. Yeah. Okay. So like by me, when you're by Prospect Park or certain areas, you have a wider street and you could do a thing I got from Tyler Muto called bubbling out, which you walk. And you just change the intent and, you know, bubble out from the other dog and say, we're not meeting and give your dog space away from the trigger. And that's if important. Yeah. Because it's not running away. Uh-uh. Right. So you're not going, oh, my God, there's a dog. We got to go this way. It like, looks like it sometimes. But you're you're more like, oh, let's just go this way and create space kind of in a. Oh. Is it like an arcing pattern or it's just whatever you well, can Here's the thing I got, and I'm, I'm name dropping, but I'd rather give credit to where I learned. Right. Again, people credit are like, you should do a workshop, it. learn from you. I'm like, learn from who I learned from. It's fine. No ego here. And Tyler Muto, another great person. So again, I'm name dropping, but I just learn from them. They're great, great people to learn from. Talked about when you're walking your dog, and especially for me in a city environment, it's a pressure valve. Where's your release? Mm. So where's your outs? Right. So I teach my students when you're walking and if you have a reactive dog or even a fearful dog of just different things, because it doesn't have to be a dog. It can be a scooter, a bicycle, a child, skateboard that your dog's uncomfortable with. Here's the thing. Advocate and manage the situation. Yeah. If you have time, you can counter condition. I see the trigger. Okay. And sadly, what I've learned from people, not dogs, is I can't trust them. I yeah. can't trust people to do the right thing. I can't trust people in general to control their dogs. What I first do is I take my dogs, the dogs on your, your, you, that, that you have working, out of the equation the best you can. Yeah. If there's a wide enough street, you bubble out and just walk. If sometimes you can just walk around a car and then go back in and avoid it, fine. It depends on your dog. depends on the other dog. How is their handling? How... Is their dog at the end of the leash? Is their dog looking at you and targeting right. or excited? What picture is that dog showing your dog? Throwing up the middle finger across the street, you know. Yeah. So that's, again, what I learned from dogs, especially my dog, Whiskey, my larger dog, that has a very high prey drive for small animals, including <laughs> small, white, fluffy dogs, is he to them, he's a rabbit. They're rabbits. Right. They're not dogs. And he's like, can I eat it? He doesn't bark. He doesn't lunge. He just like, come closer, come closer. But my dog's friendly. Don't care. <laughs> so give your dog space. When you look at sometimes from people in a positive only, they're trying to take food and lure them away. Well, once the dog's focused on something, so thresholds matter. Is yeah. the dog past threshold? So with food, the dog can't be past threshold. So the first thing before the dog's past threshold Get them out of the situation, create space the best you can. Then, if you can, put the dog, I do put them in a calm position. And I've seen online, don't make them sit, blah, blah, blah. I'm not asking them for an obedience sit, right? that they have to stay in position. I use tension on the leash, pressure up for them to submit to a lower body position, sitting or laying down. I'm in front of them. I'm in charge of the situation. I want them to have faith in me that I'm not going to allow that dog to come into their space. I don't care if they sit back up. It's basically the reason I do it is to say, chill out. Yeah. It's not a sit cue. It's chill out. So I get them in a chill position. If I have time, I use rapid reinforcement. So I do use food and techniques, how I handle the food, where if I don't feel the dog can handle the trigger, skateboard, bicycle, whatever it is. I do a high rate of reinforcement. One of my students just called it a treat bomb. Okay. Am I distracting the dog? Yeah, but I don't stop there. Okay. Yeah. So what I do is I mark 
And I don't want them looking at the trigger. I'm not asking them to do anything. I just start marking and putting a food in their mouth. As soon as my hand comes out, I mark again. So they're like, oh, another piece, another piece. And they don't really care about the dog if you do it early enough. Yeah. But if you don't and the dog reacts, food's out of the equation, pressure up, calm the hell down. Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying, nope, chill out. The better the dog can handle the trigger, the slower the rate of food. So then when I don't need to do rapid, I want them to look at the trigger. So then they see the dog, but at a distance or the bicycle or the skateboard or whatever, or the bus, they see it, mark, then they get food. Then as it gets a little closer, mark, and then reward again. What I've seen happen again from the dogs is they go from, oh, every time I see that trigger, whatever we, it is, I hear the sound that means I get food. Yeah, I like food. So what's making the food appear? What's making that sound happen that mean food appears? Okay. The dog, the skateboard, the this, okay? So they go from... I have to stop it. I have to lunge and make it go away. Because what are dogs usually doing when they're reactive? Making the threat go away because they don't have faith in us to handle the situation. So it's also even how I'm doing it and positioning. Well, and I was going to, I was going to point that out, but that is a super important part Mm -hmm. because a lot of times I'll see people have their dogs turn their back towards the trigger Mm-hmm. And then they're trying to reward the dog because they're thinking, oh, I don't want the dog to look at it. But then the human is not protecting the dog physically, right? You're not a physical right. barrier to whatever it's worried about. What I used to do was more of that. I used to have the dog with the back to the street facing me and I was marking and rewarding. What I also used to do was do the look cue or watch me command. Yeah. Okay. And again, we did talk about this on different podcasts once. And the more we look at it, I'm not against the look cue. I'm not against teaching the dog um, attention. It's great. But in this situation, if that's all we do, all we're teaching is avoidance. Yeah. I want the dog to be able to look at the trigger and not react. Yeah. Okay. I teach my students to have the dog to your side where the food is facing where the trigger is. Also, the way I do it is if you're in front of the dog, you can also turn into the dog and use spatial pressure as a form of a correction, right? Or I use upward leash pressure to slow the dog down. And yes, I'm putting my dog in a position where they can't move by seated, but I'm not asking them to do that. And people have, but they put the dog in a sit and they let the other dog get into its space where you're not giving it the option of flight. Right. I will, if there's space which people call emergency U-turn, I'll go, let's go, and mark, mark, reward to turn them. In the city, okay, there's a dog in front of me. I'm going to do the U-turn. There's a dog behind me. Okay, I'm going to go over there. There's a skateboard. There's a car. I can't cross the street. So there isn't always space to get away because, again, dog I just worked with. It wasn't just dog. It's scooters. It's bicycles. It's e-bikes. So everywhere you go, there's a trigger. So what are you going to do? Well, well, and I think (laughs) you're in Brooklyn. Sometimes you really act like you're in Brooklyn, right? So like Mm -hmm. we'll be on the phone together and and the dogs know that you're going to protect them because you're like, nope, don't touch them. Or what do you say? Like, Uh -uh. or you'll say like whiskey, that's not lunch or something. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'll tell you about that. So my dog, Whiskey, as I mentioned, high prey drive. And people, I'll tell you a funny story about it, but people still, and it happened to my student the other day, where they'll say, I'm sorry, I don't like to say my dog's not friendly, because it's not about friendly, it's what's appropriate. But people still argue with you and go, no, 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 it's okay, my dog's friendly, and (laughs) it'll be fine. Trust me. Okay. So Whiskey's about 80 pounds. Main breeds, Pit Husky. So there you go. There's a prey drive. I think it's some Rottweiler in there too. Yeah. What I do for the most part is I pull to the side, again, either between the trees on the sidewalk or I go between cars. I take my dogs out of the equation because I don't trust people and just do it. And I tell people that I see all the time, I'm just honestly just taking my dog out of the equation. Yeah. Okay. And it's annoying to do it. But when I haven't, and my dog Karma did have leash reactivity. I was two nights when she was younger and created it. But people let the dogs get into her space and she doesn't like it. 
Yeah. She doesn't have to be okay with a dog entering her space while she's on leash. She has that right. Yeah. And to just sidestep a thing, just about giving space, things I do is I'll stop at a light, but I'll pull to the side where people are crossing, but I give space. And one time, many years ago, back to what my dogs have taught me, karma's on my left. And a dog crossing is pulling at the leash and overexcited. So that makes her uncomfortable. As yeah. friendly as that dog is, she's nope. So what does she do? She moves herself to the other side of me and sits down. Yeah. What is she telling me? That's all I needed, Dad, was yeah. that much space to make sure. Because I know now I'm between you and the dog, and I know you won't allow that. But if I'm there, I'm not between you two. Yeah. Yep. A student I'm, I'm working with, again, great obedience walks and they get annoyed because the dog who's uncomfortable around dogs will go to the other side. You go, how do we stop that? I'm like, don't. Yeah. The dog's telling you I'm comfortable and it's giving itself space. That's what you want them to do. Instead of going to fight, they're going to flight. And sometimes it's not that much space. It's just enough to make them feel comfortable that you're going to handle the situation. So I don't have to. Yeah. Okay. So back to whiskey. Because people feel it's okay to let their white, fluffy dogs <laughs> run up to my dog's face, okay, when I pull him to the side, I've changed his leave it command. Because I can mark and reward, doesn't matter. You'll be marking and rewarding and people still bring their dog up. Asinine, but they do. So what do I do? I change the leave it command for him to not lunch. <laughs> now, it's not for him. It's for the people. And my one of my friends who did train service dogs says they teach service dogs enough. Why? While people want to pet the cute service dog in training, they go enough. And the dog focuses on them, not the person. But it's also telling the person, no, sorry, not enough. Ignore. 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 So when I, and it's funny sometimes when people notice it, I'll go, not lunch. And he'll look up at me. <laughs> and I'm marking reward. And he does a quick look up and people go, oh, shit. <laughs> and they literally have seen people run away. Good. Okay. Because I've told people he'll eat your dog. They don't care. Yeah. Here's a situation. Um, I had a day. Walk in my dog. Whiskey's right next to me. And this guy with a few small dogs is trying to come in my space. And I try to be nice the best I can. I just got told to F off when I just. Ask person to go the other side. It's right. it doesn't matter, even when I'm trying to be nice. So I say, no, thank you. He goes, it's okay, my dog's friendly. I go, he'll eat your dog. <laughs> Before I taught that. And he goes, No, 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 my dog's friendly. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And whiskey, people don't realize he's not barking. He's not right. lunging. Right. He's a predator. Yeah. He's just going, Oh, come closer. Just come closer. Just come closer. Right. So he's there. And the person is keep arguing with me. And I had a day and I'm just enough. I go, okay, you think it's going to be fine? I should have recorded. You're comfortable on whatever happens with your dog in mind. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I know better than you. I didn't say that. But that's their attitude. My dog's friendly. He'll magically fix your dog. People believe that. I'm serious. So I just released whiskey. I just said, break. And he just lunged at that dog. I kept the leash long, short enough that he couldn't get right. to the dog. And I was like, uh-uh, <laughs> stopped it. And then I just told him to sit. I, I did use obedience. I'm like, uh-uh. Then I told him to sit. And I go, you, should, you still feel as comfortable? That it'll work? Okay, move away. Okay? <laughs> but awesome. that, that's the thing. It's, I don't, don't try this at home. I know I can stop him. What? <laughs> don't try this at home. Or not advocate. Don't, yeah, don't try not that at home. Not saying, like, go do that. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I've, I, it, it, it gets to the point when you, and he's well-trained enough, I can tell him to stop, okay? Yeah. And he does, actually, whiskey helps me with small dogs now with reactivity, but he also knows the parameters. Yeah. You don't get, I've had him laying down as a small dog, and he can be, but he understands the expectations. But to show what I mean by his prey drive, and he used to, he'll be in a down, I have a video of this, and there's a cat under a car uh, somewhere and he's just chasing it down there's obedience but he's shaking uncontrollably right okay he's just okay so obedience but mindset still the same so again back to mindset 
I had him one time at a friend's house. Leash is off. And there was a statue of a curled up fox in, in like a bush in her backyard. And I'm like, no, karma's looking at it. And again, back to what my dogs have taught me. And I go, right. eh, let's see what he will do with the opportunity. Right. So no leash, no remote collar, no nothing. And I go, whiskey, what's that? He sees it. He does not hesitate. He runs to it and bites the statue. Probably where he cracked his tooth. Ow. Okay. Did not hesitate for a second. I have an opportunity to go get prey. Done. Yeah. So, (laughs) but go back to reactivity. So he can let dogs walk by right now and he'll look to me. You know, he knows, sorry, not for you. It's prey drive. It's something he can't control. Um, Yes, he's e-collar trained and he's been corrected for looking at dogs. And that's what previous trainer did there's nothing wrong with that every time he looked at a trigger tap tap nothing wrong with it i want him to be able to look and not react yeah. so now when he looks at the white puppy dog barking he just looks up at me like i didn't do it that i didn't do it that. <laughs> I'm like, and and now do i always give him food no oh, go good job thank you other times i still might reward him but he's yeah. hoping maybe for the reward make yeah. sense yeah Hope springs eternal in dogs. Yeah. And again, it's back to, you know, learning from my dogs, learning from the dogs I've I've worked with and trying different things. You know, if again, I still work with dogs that they don't care about food. So I'm sorry, we're going to use leash. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, but I tell my students that if they're willing to take the time and, you know, maybe more time between our lessons and work on, a food trail work on and again back to the food trail what are my students what were they doing they were doing the food trail but they were facing the end of the food trail oh. so what is that telling the dog stop. right yeah stop and you know and then they're bending over so it goes back to yeah i'm using a food trail but you know what else are you doing what is your body language doing the dog didn't trust them enough or they're like come on come on high pitched. everybody tries to use High pitched voice, and a lot of times it's not helping. Yeah. Every tool can be helpful in how you use things. So that's those little details, right? Like mm-hmm. several run across several dogs that won't eat their food. And mm-hmm. then come to find out, like the person's kind of hovering over the food bowl or something, mm-hmm. right? And so it's not that the dog doesn't want to eat, it's they're actually being polite. Because the person is over the food. <laughs> they're giving, they're miscommunicating with the dog. Or like yeah. people like my dog won't eat food in the crate. Okay, well, dogs are smart. And they're like, well, I don't want to do this. So I'm going to see who gives up first. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to starve a dog, but I can motivate with adding things to the food. I have a dog recently that separation anxiety type issues has broken out of the crate, it's chewing up the door. A very nice house, and it chews up the door. In our first session, we just talked, we did some feeding through the crate. Don't go in a crate. Crate's not an issue of being left alone. So all we really did, they didn't even didn't have to do all the steps I do for separation anxiety, and it's already great progress, was feeding in the crate with them in the room. Yeah. Okay? And they're using a food that's not that high value, so we added some real, like, not real, but, you know, chicken that they just cooked or bought or whatever and added it to it. Then we noticed that if you put, I have people, if they use kibble, wet it. So make it into a mush and they can use other things to wet it and then put it into a Kong or something, which makes it more interesting, right? So they text me eight in the morning. And once I work with you, if I'm up, I don't care. They text me, dog won't eat. I'm like, okay, well, just how long have you waited? Then they waited, dog ate, dog stopped, dog ate. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Then they added some food, dog ate. Then they put it in a Kong, ate. Next day, oh, dog's not eating. How are you feeding? In a bowl. Did you try the, the Kong with the same meal? No. Oh, now dog's eating. The big thing with dog training is problem solving. And, yeah. you know, once you understand learning theory and understanding dogs more, you can say, okay, well, what can motivate them? And some of it is just patience, waiting them out. And, you know, if they don't eat, I take it away and either next meal or an hour later, try again. Even out of the crate isn't destroying things, making good progress. 
getting rid of not using food because we say it creates excitement. Well, it can, but how are you using it? You know, yeah. saying that e collar is abusive. Oh, well, yeah, it can be, but how are you using it? Yeah. Important. I know Phyllis had this dog as a client one time and she lived in a high rise in DC, actually. So, mm -hmm. you know, kind of similar environment. And the previous trainer had the dog was reactive to dogs in the building. And so from what I understand, the previous trainer was peeking around corners like they were afraid. And then the dog would then like start to be uncertain, but also peek around the corner and then give the dog food when they saw when she saw the dog in that state of mind. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm explaining. Say, say, say it again. Please. Instead of being like the dog's advocate, right, and checking to see if the hallway was clear, the trainer was actually like peeking and fear, like fearfully checking. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. So the dog's going, you're scared. You're worried about it. I should be worried exactly. about it. Exactly. Yeah. And then giving them yeah. food to boot. And it turned this dog into a pretty reactive in the lobby and stuff with other dogs. I think the, you know, like the message is no matter what you're, <laughs> what you use, like be really careful what it's actually creating. Well, and that, what are you teaching? What, yeah. <laughs> what, what are your expectations? And something I know you've said a bunch that if you use food at the wrong timing, well, yeah, but I haven't really seen food create aggression or create stuff, obviously resource guarding. But the big thing, if you're using food to change an association, okay, with the food trails and, you know, the treat retreat, I'm not marking anything. Yeah. But for reactivity or to other things, I first create a marker, the sound of a clicker or the word yes are the main things. And how do I do that? Click food, click food. Yes, food, yes, food. You create the association. So that way I can have good timing. So they go, oh, I heard that sound when this happened and then I got the food. Because again, dogs are great at learning from patterns and sequences. Yeah. So let's create a sequence for them to understand. And if we're just randomly tossing food or randomly giving food, they're like, thanks for it, but I don't know why you're doing. What I want to understand from you, when you say more about what you were saying there, that you've seen food create aggression, in what ways? I don't think it created aggression. It created the behavior, right? So the dog wasn't actually aggressive towards dogs. She was afraid. Right. And the, and again, we didn't see the previous trainer. This was just going by what we had learned through the owner. Yeah. But I think she was ultimately afraid. But then that whole like peaking thing and probably getting her excited was rewarded. But it was just. The dog thought that's what she was supposed to do. Well, yeah. Well, that goes back to what are you rewarding? Or the, right. the saying, you get what you pet. And something I talk to my students about with reactive dogs. And again, I've never done protection sport or anything like that. But when we were at Starmark, you do a little bit. So, you know, yeah. so what we would do is you, so you'd have a dog and somebody would come over and be scary, creepy guy. Right. right. Or yeah. person. Right. And initially the dog, what do they do? Flight. They try to go behind you or hide. And then eventually the dog barks and they were like, good boy, good girl, good job. We're petting them. What do people do when a dog's yeah. scared of something? It's okay. It's okay. So when they're reacting or barking at something, it's okay. So you're unintentionally, even if it's not food, you're rewarding their behavior. Yeah. Okay. To give an example, I use ah ah with spatial pressure, and my dog just looked up at me like, what do I do? Okay. <laughs> or leash pressure. My dog, Whiskey, high prey drive. I have him off leash in a sort of like driveway, you know, backyard area. Yeah. Cat enters the area. He goes to run after the cats. I just went ah ah, and he stopped flat. Never corrected him, but I've paired that sound with leash pressure and spatial pressure. And he's like, Oh, I shouldn't do that. Yeah. Yep. Dogs learn that, that creating, I think a lot of dogs don't know how to create space between triggers mm -hmm. because yep. in our world, we have to restrict that. But, you know, working with the dogs that have freedom out here in New Mexico, they always want, I mean, 
99.9% want to just go away. And so however you teach the dog that getting more space feels better, I think they'll want to do that. Right. You know? And what a lot of people want to do here in the city is I want to walk my dogs. I want to, I want my dog not to care about those things. And I, I'm just like, it's fine, but you got to, con- and something I like to say um, is you got to consider the dog in the equation. Yeah. You know? If you have a dog that has great temperament, and and I can walk by most dogs in situations, but I don't because a lot of times when I have, they let the dog, it just happened yesterday. Okay. Um, So I wish I could kind of go back in time and try these things with Annie and Coltrane, like my first two dogs, mm -hmm. because they were trained to the point where I could walk by just about anything and they would just heal. Right. Yeah. Very well obedience trained. Sure. But what that does is the dog's looking at you going, what are you, an idiot? Because you shouldn't walk that close to that. Very, right? very then the true. dog yeah. can't really trust you to move it away from danger either. So I think there's that balance. So that, that's where I find a lot of reactivity comes from is the dog. We have them in front of us. And then a trigger comes and they're all the way in front. So how do I handle it? Now, if you teach them when there's a trigger, come back to me. Okay, great. I tell my students, if you're walking down the street, the next five people, how many of them would you be comfortable getting in your space, giving you a hug, touching your hat, touching your hair, even just getting in your space and asking you a question? Right. We're in New York. We're not so nice. Right. Okay. And they're like, none. I'm like, then why is it okay for you to do that to your dogs? You know? And send fearful dogs. People let people bend over and pet them, right? I think it's just a lack of self-awareness in what Mm -hmm. other people might need or want. And, you know, the other thing I realized, like with when I'm with my mom, who's 77 now, and she's a little slow moving and stuff, Mm -hmm. people are also clueless to older people and kind of giving them some space and trying to rush them from behind or walking right in front of them or something like that, you know? Oh yeah. So I think I, it, it is a funny thing though. I really, uh, at the grand Canyon, right. My, cause I live, I, I don't see a lot of people here. So it's kind of, it was kind of fun to like be around a lot of people. And I was walking the dogs and this lady just bends over and puts her hands out towards Chardonnay, who actually probably would have been fine with that, but oh yeah, sure, sure, fine. Like tipped in. Keep your <laughs> hands to yourself, people. Mm-hmm. Right? Oh yeah. And and I just looked at her and I was like, don't touch. And she actually like flinched. I scared her so <laughs> much. Oh yeah. I must have had that energy like really working that day. <laughs> I was like, don't well, I've had student dogs that bitten people, and um I did a lesson with them where we practice you know the dog's behind you you step up and you hand to the face to the people no thank you and what i do my student asked me the other day what would you do to tell people to control their dogs when they keep doing that what i do because everybody has headphones on and you can't even see if they're on not everybody speaks english right i actually put my hands in there towards their face and i wag my finger no and i go no thank you still doesn't always work but People always blame you because your dog might not be comfortable with it. But also, when my dog Karma was younger, I allowed all the leash meetings that I tell people not to do. I did all those things. She did go to puppy socialization. She did did get properly socialized too, but I allowed too many random leash meetings. When she became an adolescent to adulthood, a year to year and a half, I had a reactive dog. Yeah. Okay? People like, Socialize your dog. I did it all. But what happened is I didn't advocate for her. Yeah. And when she got to a certain point, I wasn't listening to her avoidance and appeasement signals when she was saying, Dad, I don't really want to do this. Yeah. I was like, ah, get over it. It's fine. You're being a drama queen, blah, 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 blah. I wasn't. I wasn't listening. I wasn't advocating for my dog. I wasn't considering my dog in the equation. I wasn't allowing her to create space. So she's like, well, fine. I'm an adult now. I'll try something. Let me I'll bark and lunge at a dog. Right. And then there you go. So, you know, but back to where we started, that's, I do use food to help change associations, but it's paired with space, advocacy, 
proper leash communication, you know, everything together. So as many tools as I can use to help the dog. So something I'm just uh, doing at the end of these is just asking all my guests, Ooh. what have you learned from dogs? Just one or two things. Dogs have taught me patience. Yeah. Even though it hasn't really transferred to people. Okay. I tell people all the time and I've students say, you know, Jason's so patient and people like Jason, I'm like with dogs. Okay. <laughs> so unlike what you were saying at all transferred to people, mm, I haven't done that for me as much as I wish, <laughs> but they've taught me more about how to understand them, appreciate them. Mm -hmm. Because people always say things come out of nowhere. I didn't notice these things. And, you know, if you listen, which is mostly watching, they will tell you. They will yeah. tell you they're uncomfortable. They will tell you and warn you about things, too. A quick thing that I tell my students now, I had um, a bag from the pet store with a bully stick in it out on, like, an uh, area. And when I come to my house, my dogs always run to the left. If they go to their beds, that's where they go after the walk. But one time I'm coming in, Whiskey just looks to the right for a split second and then goes back. Never done that. I'm like, huh, that's weird. But again, I've learned with dogs, you have to look for the little things, the yeah. little moments, the micro expressions. It's been a few days. I They never took it, which is nice training wise. But I had two boy sticks I never gave them. And he was like, dad, I'd like to have those. <laughs> so that's a dog's way of saying, can I have it? Yeah. Okay. But people go and expect the dog to press a button and tell you something or this and that. But if you pay attention and watch their body language, watch their facial expressions, they are communicating. Yes. It, it taught me that I wish people communicated better. You know, they, 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 uh, it's amazing how much they let things go. Yeah. Again, and it just makes me wish, you know, I was better at those things. <laughs> okay, but... No, that's, that's the beautiful thing about, you know, interacting with dogs and watching dogs and working with dogs is um, trying to learn from them and what they're trying to tell you if we listen. Yeah, that's a good one. Listen, listen. I need to apply it more to people, but yeah. <laughs> well, people aren't as clear in their communications for many reasons either. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we could narrow it down, because we have this thing that we're using right now, right? Talking, mm -hmm. which gets in the way of maybe what we really need to say. A hundred percent. hundred percent. That's funny. Yeah. Especially if your dogs do anything out of the norm, like what is going, why? Yeah. If, if you, and, and you, you, you do a lot of videos on this, which like, you know, with outside stuff. And I, I have a video that I share that my dog and two other dogs were walking. And if they look to where whiskey, sees the trigger and his mouth open, he's panting, he hears back. And for a split second, his ears go up, mouth closes, and mm -hmm. just a split second. If you notice that, you know something's coming. Yeah. That's how subtle it is. And people they don't look and it goes, came out of nowhere. I'm like, mm, it didn't. Yeah. But it takes time to learn. You can't you can't, you know, expect, but the more you pay attention, right? Yeah. <laughs> Funny story. So I was on the when I was walking the dogs, which I rarely am on the phone when I walk dogs, because mm -hmm. I don't like to be distracted. But Tipton started whining, which is annoying, right? It's an annoying sound. But why is he whining? It's like, why is he whining? You need to make him be quiet. And I was like, he doesn't normally do this. He is my oh, like he tells me if something's off. And sure enough, I looked over there and there was a coyote. Mm -hmm. And so if I would have just said, oh, be quiet, you, you know, bad dog. Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to what you were saying about appreciating them too. Well, listening to them, you know, considering them. Because he was doing that to protect us to say, hey, there's the danger over there. He wasn't doing it to be annoying, right? He wasn't. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I wanted to thank Jason for making time to be on my podcast and talk about how he uses food while creating a calm and happy dog. 
that can go by all kinds of distractions and obstacles in Brooklyn. Jason's business is called Canine Cohen, and I will link the videos he mentioned during the podcast in the description below. And thank you to my audience for joining me and Jason today to listen to what we have to say about food and how to use it. And I hope it was insightful and fun for you. Next time, my dad is going to be on the podcast talking about how he's lived life without a lot of limitations on what was possible for him and also his family. This relates back to dogs because I think a lot of times we put limitations on dogs and don't allow them to reach their full potential. And just a disclaimer, any training advice that we give is general and may or may not be suited for your dog. If you're having aggression concerns with your dog, please consult a professional. This podcast is intended for educational and entertainment purposes and is not meant to be individualized dog training information for your particular case. Please always use caution and common sense when working with dogs.